Welcome, I'm Stephen Winnick of the American Folklife Center of the Library of Congress. For many years, we've presented the Homegrown Concert Series featuring the best in folk music and dance from around the world. Earlier this year in the Coolidge Auditorium, we featured a concert with the astoundingly talented performer and songwriter Charlie Lowry. Now, when possible, we like to record interviews with the artists in our Homegrown Concert Series, but on that day, we didn't have time to do it live, so we're doing it here remotely. Um, I will first introduce my colleague, Meg Nicholas, who, like me, is a folklife specialist at the American Folklife Center of the Library of Congress. Unlike me, though, she's also a woman of indigenous descent, and she contributes wisdom on the stewardship and presentation of indigenous culture, among the many other things that she brings to our staff. So welcome, Meg. Good afternoon. And then, of course, it's my pleasure to introduce Charlie Lowry, who, as I said, gave a great concert in our Homegrown series. So if you're seeing this video without having seen the concert, keep in mind there's a great concert video, too, on the Library of Congress website and YouTube channel. Charlie Lowry is a singer-songwriter, a band leader, and musician from Robeson County, North Carolina, who has Lumbee and Tuscarora heritage, and her music incorporates native drum songs, soul, pop, country, and folk. And Charlie, we are delighted to have you here. Thank you, Steve. I'm honored to be here. This is very exciting. All right. Well, I, I just mentioned your tribal affiliations, and I understand that the situation of Lumbee and North Carolina Tuscarora people is a little complicated as regards federal and state recognition. Could you fill us in on that a little bit? Yes, it's it's very complicated. Uh, a lot of our, and, and this isn't, you know, this journey began many decades ago uh, in trying to correct many of the wrongs from the past. But in Robeson County, North Carolina, which is in the southeastern part of the state, uh, many of our people identify as Lumbee. And the Lumbee were federally recognized by the United States government back in 1956 but we didn't receive the full benefits. They, they put that caveat there. They said, we, we recognize you as native, but without the full benefits that other tribes, other federally recognized tribes receive. And so we're, we're in a very interesting position and are actively trying to, to correct that uh, in, in present times with the Lumbee Fairness Act is a new act that's being proposed to legislation uh, currently. And so you have the majority of the natives in Robeson County who identify as Lumbee, but there are also groups who still practice and honor their Tuscarora identity and culture as well. And also some folks who honor Sheraw lineage, So it's it's very interesting throughout throughout the years, uh, probably since the late 1800s, our people, our group of people have had many name changes over the years in trying to seek recognition, trying to to gain resources. Uh, first, it was the Croatan Indians of Robeson County that we petitioned for recognition back in the late 1800s. And at one time we petitioned as the Indians of Robeson County. Another time the Cherokee Indians of Robeson County. Because there, there's many theories as to who we are as a people. And then finally, in 1956, we were recognized as the Lumbee. So very complicated. You have a lot of, have many generations who, uh, yes, a lot of our people have a, a identity crisis going on and that has had, uh, that decision has had many ramifications for our people throughout the years. Yeah, very tricky politics. Yes, it's very mm -hmm. tricky when you get politics involved, especially as it concerns Native people, because our country has always wanted to do away with us, right? So exactly. <laughs> but we've always insisted that we were that we are indigenous, that we are native people. Well, within your tribal community there in Robinson County, how is music viewed and valued? Music 
is uh, to me, it's one of the one of the foundations of our communities. Um, we're very heavy in religion, and so myself as an artist, my first some of my first experiences with, with music were with gospel music. I grew up in the church, and and faith is at the center of many of our homes, and so gospel music. Uh, has been central to a lot of our, our our families and communities, gospel music in particular, but we also lean heavily into soul music and the blues and country and our younger generations, you know, going back from the 80s, started leaning heavily into hip hop and the hip hop culture as well. And just speaking from my personal experience, music has um, I wouldn't be the person that I am without music. I don't think I'd be alive if it if it wasn't for music. And I think many, many people from our community share that same experience, as well as our traditional songs. Well, and after your experience in, in church music, um, how did you get start started playing other kinds of music? I mean, how did you become a musician, I guess you could say? Well, I, there was always music, uh, music playing in the house uh, from the Temptations. Uh, my parents listened to a lot of the Temptations and Southern Rock, uh, Marshall Tucker, Leonard Skinner, Led Zeppelin. Uh, the, the Southern Rock sound is um, almost, uh, it gives us a, a great sense of pride to, to many Lumbee people and, and what it represents, even though... Uh, you know, some people look at, at Southern rock as like redneck, redneck music or on a bit from the Confederate folks. But uh, it just it to, to our people, it gives us a lot of fight and it, it instills a lot of pride in in our people as well and helps us to navigate some of the hardships that we've been through. And uh, also like the identity crisis that I mentioned earlier, I think it has a lot to do with us being Southern as well. Uh, a, a very notable Lumbee author, Melinda Maynard Lowry said it best when she described our people as the original Southerners. And so I think our people lean heavily into that, into our Southern identity and that music just goes hand in hand. And so I grew up listening to that and and really feeling it deep, deeply within my soul. And I grew up singing in the church. But when I was 12 years old, I won Junior Miss Lumbee and served as a dignitary for our people for a year. And that was really the first opportunity that I had to travel outside of my tribal community and visit other tribal communities throughout the state and throughout the nation as well. And usually I was always asked to sing. And so that's when I started singing, started uh, buying cassette tapes for instrumentals and singing uh, songs by artists like Celine Dion, uh, Whitney Houston, Christina Aguilera, Mariah Carey, Aretha Franklin. And so that's where some of those other influences came from for me. And I really didn't start writing songs until I was in college, until I, till I entered my college years. And, uh, but I'll, I'll go back when I was 12, I was introduced to the hand drum, the native American hand drum by my mentor, Pura Fay. And, uh, she was our culture teacher. Uh, we had a, a, a group known as the seventh generation society. And so Pura Fay along with another one of our mentors, Reggie Brewer, and also another fine gentleman by the name of Carl Anthony Hunt. Those three people were instrumental uh, for me as a teen growing up and exploring our indigenous heritage. And so I picked up the hand drum and started learning more traditional and contemporary indigenous songs. And so I, I had that influence as well throughout my teenage years. And then when I entered college, I composed my first original song using the hand drum and it was a song called Brown Skin and I composed it with uh, two of my best friends at the time who were also from uh, tribes in North Carolina from the, the Kohari tribe was my friend Brittany Jacobs 
And then from the Halawasa Pony tribe came Courtney Richardson. And the three of us together formed an acapella group in college called One Voice. And so we got together and started composing songs and performing, performing them on campus. And that was another opportunity to get in front of a diverse audience. I went to UNC Chapel Hill and, you know, there are folks from all over the world with various backgrounds that attend that institution. And so that really gave us a chance to educate others and raise awareness. And that became part of my aesthetic as an artist. And uh, while I was in college, I, I had a minor in music performance. And I saw an advertisement for a, a Motown band who was looking for a lead singer. The Motown band was a 10-piece band called Mr. Coffee and the Creamers. And so I auditioned and became one of their lead singers and just added more to my, you know, the soul repertoire with Mr. Coffee and the Creamers. And that, uh, that experience helped me develop the hunger for the live, the live band sound. And so uh, during my college years, my sophomore year, actually, I, I decided to compete in American Idol, which was wildly popular at the time and had just came out when I was in college. I competed on season three and, and made it as a semifinalist in the, the top 16 by the time it was all, over, all said and done with. And uh, from there, I began writing more songs and working with producers. And that, that's what began my independent music career. So Meg, did you want to follow up with uh with another question? Well, I was just saying it. It sounds like uh your your entry into college was a real turning point of when you left that that tribal community, and that's when uh, a lot of what you're doing now the the you know pieces got put into motion. Yes, um, a lot. You know, like I said, when I grew when I was growing up, I was kind of limited to what was being played on, you know, the local radio stations. And most of the time, if you were around home, if you were with your family, like my grandparents, they only listened to gospel music. So whenever I was with my grandparents, I knew that's all that I was going to hear was 89.5 FM, the gospel music station. And, you know, when I was riding riding with my mother in the car, I, I got to experience a little more, but it wasn't until I made it to college that I started exploring more genres of music, jazz, classical music. Um, I got into uh, like bossa nova and Latin music just from, from some of the courses that I was, I was taking. So yeah, my college years really opened the gateway um, to exploring more more genres and more cultures and expanding my voice, you know, training my voice to be able to sing those styles of music. Mm -hmm. In addition to the music that I was, you know, learning from Pura Fay, I still kept, uh, Pura Fay was lead singer and one of the founding members of Ulali. And for, for your audience, if you're not familiar with Ulali, they, are, they were a, a groundbreaking and very pioneering uh, Native women's a cappella group who used hand drums and shakers and their voices for instrumentation. And they had a way of combining traditional and contemporary elements of, of Native music and creating this, this whole beautiful sound, uh, a feminine divine sound, if you will, and it, it just changed my life hearing that as a teenager. And I kept that album very close to my heart. They released an album called Mok Chi. And I kept that album very close to my heart and on repeat in my head. And so I had those elements going on as well. And they've had a heavy influence on my sound as an artist. All right. So another question, <clears throat> you know, you've mentioned taking up the hand drum and the influence of native music and the influence of a lot of other genres of music. Another instrument that you play in concert is guitar. So how did you uh, start playing the guitar? My paternal grandfather was actually the first person, I think, that, that I really remember uh, very fondly having an intimate relationship with um, and, and watching him play his guitar. 
he wasn't he wasn't an efficient fish an aficionado he wasn't uh, very technically sound or anything like that. He didn't have any training. He was just naturally gifted in a way. And on Sunday afternoons after church, not every Sunday, but uh, whenever some of his friends from Michigan came into town, I remember they always used to jam on Sundays. Whenever they were in town after church, they would sit around and just pick uh, their their guitars. He had an electric uh, guitar, a Les Paul studio edition and uh that's the first guitar i i remember i remember seeing as a child and i think that sparked my love as well for live music and so um i ended up getting and purchasing my my mother purchased a, an acoustic guitar for me for christmas one year and uh, i think I, that may have been when i was a teen but i didn't pick it up then I really didn't pick up the guitar until I started playing with the band that I helped to find a forum called Dark Water Rising. But after I, I was in Mr. Coffee and the Creamers and after I graduated from college, I wanted I wanted that live band sound. You know, I tried tried writing songs to tracks that were already given to me, uh, songs that were given to me on compact disc. And I would write to them, you know, songs that had been produced, the whole tracks. But I wanted that live sound and that live, that feeling of a live band performance that I felt with Mr. Coffee and the Creamers. So the uh, producer that I was working with at the time, he and I started a band along with uh, four of our other closest friends at the time. And we we're all, na all native, all identified as Lumbee, except for Brittany. Uh, my friend Brittany that I mentioned earlier, uh, she joined the band as well. And when we formed Dark Water Rising, none of us were really uh, proficient at instruments. And, and we all picked our perspective instrument and was like, let's roll with it. So the producer at the time was Aaron, Aaron Locklear. He, he, had, um, he was a drum major in high school or he was in, in the marching band in high school and so his drum his instrument of choice were the drums and then our friend at the time Corey Locklear decided to go with electric guitar and then one of our other mutual friends Eric Trent Locklear came along and he had played some bass in church grow, you know growing up and so he was like I'll, I'll buy a bass let's go we're going to form this band I'll pick up the bass and his girlfriend at the time who is now his wife a uh, Sierra Locklear she was like, okay, well, I'll try keys. And she, so she went, bought a keyboard. I had my acoustic. And then Brittany, uh, I think maybe she took, um, she might have played the sax in middle school band or something, but she was like, I'll get a sax. And so each one of us had our instruments and we put this band together. And, and that's really how I began playing guitar out of necessity uh, for, for Dark Water Rising. And so we were together through uh, a couple of different lineup changes for 12 years. I was wow. one it, of the lead singers for Dark Water Rising. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really impressive that these folks could just pick an instrument almost at random, you know, whatever they <laughs> they, yeah, they felt they might be best at and go ahead and learn it. So, yeah. Yeah, that goes back to your question about, you know, music and its significance in our community. Um, I like to liken Robeson County and that region uh, in particular as, as to like a Muscle Shoals or a, a Motown. Um, it's, it's an undiscovered pool of, you have an undiscovered pool of talent there. And, and I, I try to make it part of my mission as an artist to recognize that and to, to raise awareness around that and, and uh, we have a bit of a collective going on at home now uh, with some of our younger generations. We've, we've, we're coming together and we're releasing more music and we're playing, playing, um, playing live, uh, live more. You know, for many years, most of our, our best musicians played in the church. And so now we're seeing a, an, an evolution where folks are starting to get out more and, and play in the public and share their talents. With, with other folks. So I'm excited to see that. And uh, it just it just comes very natural 
for many of our people, music does. And singing, singing especially. Uh, if, you'll, if you'll ask Pura Faye, one of the best singers in the whole wide world, um, if, if, again, for your audience, y'all should check her out. Uh, she, she says that some of the best singers come from Robeson County. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll second that. Everyone should really check out Pura Faye if you haven't heard her before. Um, and I'll also mention, you know, you're talking about Robinson County and the Lumbee community there. And I noticed there's a lot of Locklears in your band. And we've had previously in our series, Lakota John Locklear and his mm -hmm. whole family who are also from your co corner of the state. Um, and I assume they're somehow related to the Locklears who were in your group. It's a it's a big family down there. So, uh, well, it's it's a tribal. It's a tri It's a, a tribe of people. So many of our people don't venture away from Robinson County. So naturally, you're going to have a lot of Locklears. You're going to have a lot of Lowry's. You're going to have a lot of Jacobs, uh, just like you have a lot of Smiths that are all over the United States. But your people just happen to travel more and expand more. But our people are communal. So that's why you have those common surnames in the region. But Lakota John and his family, we grew up, we live about 10 minutes from one another. So he, yes, he's from Pembroke, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. Right. All right. So, uh, Meg, did you want to follow up? Uh, well, just you had mentioned, you know, when you went off to college, you started listening to a lot more genres. And that's very reflected, I think, in your music as well. You've written music that straddles a number of genres itself. You've got traditional hand drum songs. You've got swing and roadhouse blues. How would you describe your music to someone who hasn't heard it before? I still feel like uh, whenever <clears throat> I was one of the principal songwriters in Dark Water Rising, and we described our sound as rocky soul. It's very unique. And I still feel like a lot of that carries over in the sound that I have as well. Um, it's rocky soul. It's bluesy uh, folk. I write about a lot of issues pertaining to indigenous folks and, and uh identity, struggling with identity, um, raising awareness around Mother Earth. <clears throat> and I've, I've been through some heavy stuff uh, throughout my life in, in, you know, pertaining to my health. And so I'm, I'm really keen on what it means to fight for your life and, and the struggle just to live. And so I, I focus a lot of my material on life and death so it, sometimes it can have a very heavy and powerful sound as well. So, yeah, I'd say Rocky Soul and, and then, you know, all other genres that you mentioned. I like, I like that you hear that Roadhouse Blues in there. <laughs> That's nice. So, you, you know, you mentioned the kind of uh, tribal nature of, of the area and the fact that um, – there's there's long lines of history in each family. And in one of your songs, you talk about the Lowry gang and being descended from Henry Lowry. Could you tell us about that a little bit? Yes. Henry Barry Lowry was a distant cousin of mine. And Henry Barry led. He, he was a revolutionary around the times of the Civil War down in Robinson County. Uh, you had the Confederate Home Guard there. Who, who were sent and placed to, to keep an eye out on, on the, the Indians there, the wild Indians that, that lived in the swamps there. And in doing so, they committed a lot of injustices and atrocities that were just, you know, kind of pushed along to the wayside, not, not um, what's the word I'm looking for, not addressed by the state government or any anything dealing with the state there it was kind of like a wild wild west wild east if you will and so henry barry had had enough he had had enough of the framing of our people and the story the story goes that he stood by in the distance and watched as his father and his brother were executed by the, the home guard after they were framed for stealing hams and that was just one that was one incident that kind of that was the tipping point for him. And then after that, he, you know, formed the Lowry gang, which 
consisted of native men, uh, freed black men and poorer whites that made up this multicultural gang. And they led the Lowry Wars. They're known as the Lowry Wars, a 10 year guerrilla warfare against the Confederate Home Guards. At the time, they were also trying to round up our native men and force them into labor to build Fort Fisher in Wilmington, North Carolina, which is uh, it's about a, about an hour and a half to two hours from, from home. And they were sending our men there away from their families. And Henry Berry and the gang just couldn't stand for it any longer. And so they're, uh, at, one of the, at, at one time, he was one of the most wanted men in the country. And I, I've, I've found out within recent times that Jesse James was heavily influenced by Henry Berry's story. And so, you know, the papers at, at the time portrayed him and the gang as a nuisance. But really, he was he was a hero for our people and, and standing up in a time where you just, you know, you just people. A lot of people were hiding who they were. Um, and Henry Berry was a leader for us. Uh, so I have a sort of a follow up question with that. You know, you you write a lot of music that deals with a lot of heavy issues, uh, you know, health and grief and very painful indigenous history. So how do you balance um, the telling of these stories through your music with the self care that's needed to to constantly be dealing with these stories? Hmm. Ooh, how do I balance it? Well, just just to, to to give you a little bit more insight about me as a person, I've lived through two uh, kidney transplants. I was diagnosed with an autoimmune disorder when I was 18 years old. I had my first kidney transplant when I was 25 and I had my last one in 2020 and music has really been a saving grace for me. And just, just the ability to get out those emotions, to get out some of those emotions and put it into song and then share those songs with audiences and, and have audience folks in the audience relate and come up to me and tell me their personal stories of grief or, or their own health battles or their own, uh, questions with their own identities that helps me to to balance it a lot just knowing that it's actually helping people that it's actually medicine to other people is, is a form of self-care for me that i'm not holding it in um, that i'm not dealing with it on my own that i'm using live performance and and the fact that in this day and age we can distribute music so easily and reach so many people with it that helps me a lot to, to find that balance. And then just going through my own health battles, I always encourage people to just, to just uh, go to sleep, take a nap, rest, make sure you rest. Uh, we live in such a fast paced society. And uh, I wrote one song called Race Against the Sun. It, it talks about the rat race of modern day society. When at the, at the end of the day, we're really in a race against uh, the sun and time and, and the universe and how insignificant we really are in the grand scheme of things. That helps me to balance things out, to, to humble myself and then in turn help to humble others to realize that, you know, we're, we're really insignificant when you think about the universe and Mother Earth. It just helps to, you know, put it into perspective. That help that helps me to stay balanced and my faith, you know, my faith helps me, my relationship with with God, with the Creator. So one thing that is kind of amazing, given what you just told us about your your health issues that you've had for a long time and your uh, your own musical career, um, is that you did find time to compete on American Idol, and I think you know that's something that's really unusual for the folks that we 
typically have in our series. So um, if you could tell us a little about the experience of being on American Idol and how uh, how that went, how it felt and um, and, you know, what the process was like, that would be great. Sure. Uh, growing up as a child, we had Star Search. And I loved watching Star Search, but it seemed like such a big, I don't know, Ed McMahon and the whole stage. And it just, it just seemed like it was out of reach for me as a child for some reason. I don't, I don't know why, but once I entered college, American Idol came around and it was just a singing competition. You know, you didn't have to play anything. You didn't have to, it seemed very low pressure. And I had had a lot of experience with performing to those backing tracks uh, growing up that I mentioned. And so I felt like I was strong and ready to compete in something like that. And so I sat, I sat through and watched season one and uh, season two came along. And the whole time I was like, I can do that. I can do this. This, this is what I've been waiting for. And I remember, uh, it was the second season and I, I made the decision. I was like, that's it. I'm not, I'm not watching another season. I'm going to compete. And so I asked my first cousin if she would drive me down to Atlanta, which is where they were holding the closest auditions to me. And we went down to the Georgia Dome. She was like, yeah, I'll go. So we put her Ford Contour in the wind and just she and I, it just felt like a Thelma and Louise kind of thing. We were, we felt so independent, you know, because um, we were very sheltered growing up. But that, us being able to get away and drive down to Atlanta, just it, it helped us to have a sense of independence. That whole experience was a very um, just freeing experience for me. And so we went down to, to Georgia there were about 10,000 other contestants there. I gave them 30 seconds of my best proud Mary that I had in me. And I, I made it to the next round, which I had to come back the next weekend and compete in front of the executive producer, which you don't you don't realize that watching the show, how many auditions you have to do behind the scenes to, to make it to the show. And so I didn't know what to expect each time. And each time I competed, after hearing some of the amazing voices that were in there, I was like, I'm going home. I'm going home. I'm not going to make it past the next round. I, I still had that voice of doubt in my head. But I ended up um, making it to the top 117. And that's when they actually flew us out to Hollywood to compete for the top, the, the top 32. Yeah, the semifinalist spots. And so uh, went went that week, and that's when they they put us in groups. You know, you do the group audition where they put you with people you've never sang with before, and you're expected to get along together. And that's when the drama ensues, and the cameras catch it and create your story. And uh, and then one for one particular audition, we had to write our own original verse and chorus of a song from a list of song titles that they provided for us. We were to, to select one title and write a verse and chorus for it. And mine was Limousine Love. That was <laughs> one of the topics, so I chose to write on that. And uh, I, you know, made it to, I ended up making it to the top 32 that week. And then uh, a couple months later is when they flew us out. Each week they flew a group of eight out and you competed then for those top 12 spots. And that's when I appeared on national television. They also flew my parents out. Two of my best friends went with me and it was just a great experience. It's priceless now to go back and watch that audition just to see my mother and father on it. I love that. And uh, that's when I sang Chain of Fools mm -hmm. and Randy Jackson told me it was a bit pitchy. <laughs> and uh, Paula Abdul absolutely loved me. She said, oh, they had one little segment where Paula was like, Charlie Lauer, I love Charlie Lauer. She's so charismatic. And then uh, that's when Simon Cowell said, you're a pretty girl, but you're a bit old fashioned. And I was, like, <laughs> I was 20 years old at the time. And I was like, what do you mean old fashioned? You know, but now I get it. I understand. It means I'm an old soul. 
I come from a, a community where we have a lot of old souls, just rich in, in soul. And, and, you know, we, we, we like to stick to the good old days and remember the good old days and what that was like. And, and I think a bit of that seeped over into, you know, my pre, the presentation that I gave for American Idol. But it was a great experience. I had the awesome opportunity to compete with the likes of Jennifer Hudson and Fantasia Barino. And I'm loving seeing these girls, these women get get so much uh, attention now here recently. You know, Fantasia with the color purple. And I've just been enjoying seeing her get that that notoriety that she deserves. All right. Well, you know, if you're going to trust the opinion of one of those people, it's got to be Paula, right? I mean, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, but you know, Randy gave me something to think about. And yeah, uh, sure, yeah. pitch is something that I, I'm still working on uh, to this day. So, you know, you can just take it all in stride. It was definitely a crash course into the music industry because a lot of what I experienced during the competition uh, that was jam packed within that short frame of time. I've been experiencing it throughout this uh, almost 20 years now that I've been on this independent journey as an artist. You mentioned that they had you writing music as part of that challenge. Could you tell us a little bit more about how you approach writing new songs? Whew. You, that's interesting because I'm sitting in a, in a, a, a home studio now where I've been um, com trying to compose new material for my debut solo album. And each song is different. I'll tell you that. Um, some of them just come, some of them just seem like they come, they land right in my head and just seep on out and they're easy to write. Uh, some songs, I hear the melody in my head first, like I could compose a, a whole song in my head with the melody and then just try to transcribe the chords and the progressions and everything. Some songs are the other way around. You hear the chord, the music first, and then you write. Uh, here lately, I've been struggling. I've been experiencing some writer's block to where I'll, you know, hear the music and, and I can get the hook, but I'm having a hard time developing the story. I, I've been saying, what am I trying to say? What, what, or what message do I want to put out there? Where is this story going? So it, each song, it, it's just, it just varies with, from one song to another. Um, sometimes I'm a bit critical, like overly critical about my work. And, and I, I get in my own way at times. And, and I've been experiencing that, but I love it. I love songwriting. I love studying uh, songwriting. And um, it just keeps things interesting. Just it, just the challenge of, of writing. And then when you get a great song, like, like right now, we've got a great song that has, has developed over the last six months into this beautiful work of art. And uh, it's just very satisfying to see something like that come to fruition and to be able to tell the story and to capture the vibe the way that you want to. Yeah, like uh, a song like Backbone um, is heavily inspired by my health journey and, and my own knowing that there were times when I couldn't get my body to do anything. It just wanted to rest. But then I remembered the day that I could actually get out of, put, put my feet on the ground and put one foot in front of the other and walk. It sounds so simple. But when you reach that point, you'll you you understand what I'm talking about and, and the triumph that you feel when when things are looking up for you and, and not letting yourself be defeated and finding that inner strength. And that's that's what a song like Backbone is all about. And I also mentioned Henry Barry Lowry and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in that song of, of having resistance and, and being resilient. And, and fighting for the things that are right and just knowing that the fight makes you stronger in the end. What don't kill you makes you stronger. You will win in the end. And uh, what don't kill you makes you stronger. You've got to get up and take a stand. 
And so a lot of my songs, if I if I want to relay a message to audiences, I'll be sure to write about those topics or really focus in on those topics and and dedicate songs to certain issues. So it just varies again from one song to the next. My approach. Like a song like like Brown Skin that I wrote in college, that song was composed with the hand drum and vocals at the time because I didn't know how to play anything else. And so I used the hand drum and the rhythm of the drum and and it's it's you know between the voice and the drum it fills the song out. It's almost like you, you know I perform it a cappella a lot because that's all it really needs at its core. So you mentioned your band, uh, Dark Water Rising, um, and nowadays you perform as a solo artist, and also we've seen you book with Charlie and the Sunshine. So why don't you tell us a little about how people can find you, like what 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 uh, your musical projects are now, what people should be looking for? Well, now it's it's really just Charlie Lowry. So uh, any any band that I perform with is going to be known as Charlie Lowry. Charlie and the Sunshine was a project that I was uh, working on with the collective from home. We were selected to participate in the American Music Abroad program, which is a, a, a governmental program. I forget the department that that curates that. But um, I, as I mentioned, I'm working on my debut solo album, and you'll be able to find that soon uh, digitally. And I'm also going to have some merchandise available at, at my live performances. I'm getting ready to go on a spring tour in uh, April, uh, March, April, and May, and I'm really looking forward to that. So you'll be able to find the music online, iTunes, Amazon, Spotify, YouTube as well. So if you'll just look up my name, and it just depends on the, the performance, the type of gig and what they're looking for. As to the presenters are looking for as to whether I'll be solo or with a, a band. So, All right. Good to know. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, well, for your homegrown concert, uh, you know, leading into this, you were invited to the Library of Congress, the National Library, to play on our stage and be part of our, our national collection. So how does that feel both as a musician and as an indigenous woman? It's an honor. Uh, I'm just honored to be able to to talk with y'all and share and to have this type of representation for for native folks, uh, native musicians, and as an indigenous woman. It means a lot because I often feel like we're not seen, especially natives on the East Coast. The the history books portray us as if we're a, an invisible people, an extinct people that we were all killed off, but that's not the case. And it's going to take platforms such as y'all's to help give us more of a voice as Indigenous people, more of our, our national programs and institutions uh, have profited greatly for centuries off of the, the backs and the work of Indigenous and, and Black folks. And so it's nice to see more representation that y'all are, are inviting us to the table more. And the Library of Congress was just amazing to me. You know, I the same day I performed for y'all, I performed at the Kennedy Center as well. But I hadn't been asked to perform at the Library of Congress in years past. And it was just an honor because, <clears throat> and I didn't have a chance to visit the library, but I could only imagine the, the information that is stored there on our people, specifically people, our indigenous people in North Carolina. And I'm curious to go back and do some research and, and find out some of the things that we just don't learn about. Our, our education systems have, have failed us in this way that we just, it's important history that many generations need to be made aware of. And, and I think your, your homegrown series is doing a great job and, and taking the initiative to invite more voices that have been silenced for way too long. And so it, it means a great deal to me to serve as an ambassador for my people in that way. And, and it's icing on the cake to be able to just share my voice to, to carry the message as well. well yeah, we well, we hope you. 
Yeah, I was Go just going to say, we, we hope that uh, you do come back to the library and, and uh, do some research in the archive. And I want to come back and perform on that stage. You know, when, when I was in, there in the dressing room and saw all of the, you know, Paul McCartney and the pictures and some of the other more famous American artists, it just made me want to see a Native person's face hanging on that wall as well. So I want a residency there. How about it? Let's do it. <laughs> yeah, we'll thank see, all. We'll, thank we'll see what we can do. I would love that. It's, it's so important. And, and again, I'm not the only, you know, I'm not the only artist. Uh, we've got so many more people that are, that are, they would do a fine job on that stage as well. It's just all about representation mm -hmm. and, and acknowledging that our people are still here and still contributing to today's society. Yeah, I, I think that we're definitely experiencing a, a yes. renaissance of sorts of indigenous art and media right now. Um, why do you think that native led projects and expression are getting seen on a national international stage in a way that they haven't before? Ew, why? What was the tip? What's the tipping point? I, hmm. It's, it's definitely because of, of our ancestors and the fights that they've had throughout the centuries that they didn't let up. If they would have let up, it's it's for the work that they done. It's for the work that my elders have done. It's for the work that folks like uh, Pura Fay have done, uh, Robbie Robertson, uh, uh, Link Ray, uh, a lot of other artists that the the mainstream still doesn't know about. But it's 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 for their work. Gary Farmer, um, Derek Miller the work that those folks have done to get us to this point that we're at today. I think that's why. And, and just being in the, in the rooms with the right people, making those connections, working hard to network and folks are, are finally starting to reconcile with what has been done uh, to silence indigenous peoples. Uh, truth and reconciliation is happening. And, uh, it's just because we wouldn't we wouldn't stop or people wouldn't stop raising our voices and raising hell. That that's what it is. You know, sometimes you have to do that to to see results. Well, Charlie, thank you so much. Uh your your music, your your activism, your strength have been an inspiration to our audience and this interview will continue that inspiration. And one of the things I like to do in ending these is to ask if there's anything that we didn't cover that you would like to say to our Library of Congress audience. I can't think of anything. I really can't think of anything. Yes, uh, support, seek out native, native artists. Um, it's okay to hire native artists all throughout the year, not just during Indian Heritage Month. It's okay. You don't, I know some, some institutions like to check that box. Uh, equity and inclusion and diversity is a big thing, a big topic. Folks are get, getting new jobs because of it. Uh, but it's not necessary. You know? I mean, it shouldn't have to be necessary, but it, it's okay to hire, hire our Native folks and put them in these places all year round. That was a, that was a great message. Okay. <laughs> Good. Meg, anything else from you? Uh, I mean, I th how do you how do you top all of that? You know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. How do you top that message? Yeah. All right. Well, in that case, Charlie, we just want to thank you so much for not only the fantastic concert, but then for coming back and taking the time to talk with us here in this interview. It's been a pleasure to have you at the Library of Congress. Thank you so much. Thank y'all. It's been a pleasure working with you as well. Thank you. And I look forward to more. Us too. <laughs>